should remind you what we've done so far. So what we had was uh, first the fact that in order to understand the point of the FK model or random cluster model, and so that this was looking like, you know, cutting out a piece of graph uh, out of D, uh, out of Z squared, uh, that approximates, uh, well, let's say, of delta Z squared, and that approximates a given domain D, and then we were just, you know, deciding that all edges on this boundary were open, and that, say, all edges that were going out here were closed, which, roughly speaking, corresponds to that that path was what we call free, and that this corresponds to that in the dual picture, basically, here in the dual graph, there were some edges here that were uh, open for the dual picture, so that you had a sort of, sort of symmetric picture with two boundary points, A and B here. That plays a special role where basically these things happen. And then once you have this dual picture between uh, uh, open edges for the initial uh, configuration and open edges for the dual configuration, there was a unique curve gamma, you know, from here to there that goes around, that sort of separates the cluster attached to this one to the dual attached to that one. And there was this nice interpretation uh, of the this entire picture by, you know, shifting things by 45 degrees and then having these, uh, you know, the, these loops and the interfaces and so on uh, that led basically to the definition in the twisted picture, I mean, the tilted picture of, uh, of uh, this r random, I mean, this curve gamma that goes from A to B that, you know, had to wind at each step like this on some graph, so which is an intermediate you know, uh, right. And so that things, we wanted to understand things in terms of properties of this curve gamma. And so gamma was, uh, I mean, defined, we defined for each sort of edge E, F of E, so I'm just recording things so that you remember things correctly was expected value of indicator function that E belongs to gamma, uh, E to the I over two times the winding uh, from, so if we say this is E from by gamma from E to B. And there was a little even odd uh, symmetry uh, story that was telling you that if I take a given edge E, you know, because if you color this in a checkerboard fashion, the rule of the game here is always that the curve gamma leaves black uh, on your right and white on your left, that this uh, had the implication that if I look at a given edge here, E, then say if black is here and white is here, it has always, okay, then this one has to go, uh, the only direction at which gamma can go through this edge is like this, and so that, therefore, W, you know, uh, for a given edge uh, E, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's some angle, say, of theta of E, which is, uh, you know, either 0 pi over 2, pi or 3 pi over 2, uh, plus, uh, so this is a plus something that belongs to uh, two, uh, two, so I mean, some multiple of 2 pi. Right? So the winding here can only be theta of E plus certain number of times times 2 pi. And therefore, when you write this, you know, this quantity is just e to the i over 2 times theta of e, which is a constant that depends only on e. And then, depending on if this k is even or odd, because you have just i over 2, you have a minus 1 to power even or odd. Right? Sort of a, so this is indicator uh, k even minus indicator k odd. Right, so this quantity, if you want, is just e to the i theta of e over 2 uh, times the probability to that e goes through gamma uh, in an even way with even number of terms around it. This is with minus probability that e 
belongs to gamma in odd terms. Right. So it's just a, this f is, in a way, looking at the difference between the probability to go through a point winding an even number of times before hitting or going through that point winding an odd number of times. Because this is just minus 1 to power k. OK. So it turned out that this was a very useful way to, to think about things. Because, I mean, the, the first remark is that if I take an, if I have a point, in a, I mean, a site z like this, and I have my four n east, west, and south, uh, that anyway, so imagine that here theta, you know, e to the i theta is 1 e to the i theta is i. I mean, i theta over 2. Here you have e to the i pi over 4, because you take an e to the i, maybe you have 3 i pi over 4 here. Right? So that whatever you do, the f, say, on here would be your real number. Right? Because this guy, you have to go in the same direction as the way you go out to b. This guy, you would have to go through this direction. So you go in the opposite direction than the one you have to end out with. So you have a i factor uh, in front. So f will be a multiple of, of this complex number, of that complex number. And this, in this direction, there would be multiples of these two uh, complex numbers. Okay. And we saw that there was this relation f of uh, north plus s f of south, which is equal to f of east plus s of west. And therefore, that these two equations could be interpreted of as if we define f of z to be the f of the value at this site to be the, this, this sum or this sum, then that f of north, I mean, f of east was the real part of that number, f of west, the imaginary part by definition, and f of north, the projection on e to the i, 3 i pi over 4, and uh, the other one, and the other one. And then what I told you is that. F, once, you, once we knew this, so this came out just of this combinatorial picture with these loops, opening up one loop or not. And what I told you is that uh, this could be interpreted you know, as an analytic function, as a discrete analyticity result for the edges, uh, for, for F defined on sites, in the sense that if I take four sites here, that uh, the discrete gradient of F here and the discrete gradient of f here were related to each other by just one was equal to the other one multiplied by a factor of i. And so then I defined in a sort of a, I mean, that's everything Stas does. It's not me, right? Then you define, you know, this function h defined on faces such that h of a black face minus h of an adjacent white face is always equal to the square of uh, the value of f along the, the separating edge. So if this is black, this is white, e is here. So here h here is larger than h here. And the difference is given by this number here. So maybe you could think, uh, how did the you know, Stas think about defining this function h? So it's actually, maybe this is something I didn't uh, explain so much. This is a very natural thing to do if you think about uh, the picture here, right? Because, of course, here we don't like i e to the 3 i pi over 4 i, and this turning this way is not, uh, uh, you know, we have the feeling that there's a square missing. Okay. So it's natural. If you think, if you look at f squared, you could say, well, if I look at f squared, it will be still be a uh, complex number. And f squared here will be real. You know? Here we'll have minus 1, and here we'll have something like uh, uh, i and i here, right? Or minus i here. So if you look at the projection, if you look at what happens to f squared, f squared will be real here, or negative here, and so on. So now, if you look at the discrete, if you try to say, well, what, what is the, I mean, if I go from here to here, you know, 
imagine this is black and this is white. I mean, this is white. If I go from here to here, right, then, so if this is, say, black and this is white, what you will see is that um, Could I explain this? So, what I want to explain to you is that in a way, H right, is nothing else than a discrete uh, integral of, I mean, it's nothing else than the imaginary part of a discrete integral of F squared. So, in other words, uh, Let's put it this way. Uh, if I look at h of b minus h of w, right, in some sense, it's nothing else than the imaginary part of uh, f of e squared. So that would be the value on this guy here times uh, b minus w. Maybe there's a square root of delta here, too. And maybe there's a sign somewhere. So. I guess the sign is, yeah, okay, that's okay. So what the, the value here minus the value here, right, h w minus h white, h black, right? So it's f of e squared, right? And f of e squared, you can view it as f of e squared. Now, you have this, uh, you know, it, it will be just uh, the projection of f of e squared on the direction, you know, of f of e. Uh, of f of e squared. So, you know, f of e squared is in the real direction. So, what you end up here with is basically, you know, you know w minus uh, black divided by i uh, square root of delta, something like that. So you just look at the real part of f of e squared. And the real part of f of e squared just is nothing else than the modulus of f of e squared. You know, this is a real number, by definition, because this edge you know, is one where this guy's i is 1. So you just say, uh, here, the, the, in, in that picture here, if you look at this picture here, this is just equal to f of e squared. Right? And so you could decide you know, that this is just, you can view, view it as f of e squared. Now, this guy here, from here to here, basically, if this is size delta, uh, would be just, you know, uh, the imaginary part. So I just put this like this, times white minus black. So white minus black here is nothing else than i times uh, minus i times delta. So I divide by uh, delta, and I take the imaginary part, and maybe I put the minus. Okay. So what you see, oh, so here there's no square root. So what you see here is that, but, but this you can do in any direction, actually. So this is also true here. When you go from here to here, then this guy will be an imaginary part. So you may think, well, the, I mean, this would be different. But no, no problem, because uh, you are taking the imaginary part, of, and, but the, the move is horizontal. And so the divide division, uh, when you take the imaginary part, you will indeed become take exactly f of e squared. Okay. So the claim is that in some sense h, if you define it in some way h, is nothing else than the discrete uh, integral as the imaginary part
of the discrete integral of f squared. Right. If you look at how h moves from one point to another, you know you're just following the increases of uh, f squared along these things. So you know it's a discrete version of uh, you know h of uh, an h here minus a, I mean of a face here minus h of a face here would be just you know the imaginary part of the integral between uh, f and f prime of dz, I mean d, well, whatever, d, d uh, just to see that it's dz times uh, uh, f squared of z. Okay. So it's just a discrete analog of the primitive of f squared. Now, what makes life difficult, right, which is the reason why things, you know, we had to go through all this mess, is that if you have a discrete analytic function f, there are many things you can do with discrete analytic functions because the real part will be harmonic, discrete harmonic, the imaginary part will be discrete harmonic, you can have harmonic conjugates, and so on. But one thing you cannot do is to square it. The square of a discrete analytic function is not discrete analytic. So, not always. So, so which is, that's the reason why, by doing this, the function h we ended up with was not harmonic. We had a function h restricted on the black edges, which was, you know, subharmonic, and the one restricted on the other ones, which was superharmonic. But in, they were not harmonic. You know, there was something was. Uh, so you, there is a slight, you know, uh, problem at that moment because f squared is not. An analytic function, a discrete analytic function. Now, there is still, I mean, things you can say. So let me just uh, remind you a couple of things, uh, so that it's clear that uh, maybe about you know discrete analytic analyticity and co continuous analyticity, so that you are not lost uh, with this type of arguments. If you know, if you have a discrete analytic function f, and you only know its real part. then you know it's imaginary part also up to additive constant, right? It's clear here from that picture, you know, if you know, if I know the gradient here in that direction, right, I, I say, I know, that means that I know the gradient in that direction, it's just the gradient in this direction multiplied by a factor minus i. So that means that if I know the gradient of the real part in that direction, then I know the gradient of the imaginary part in that direction. And vice versa. So basically, if you know, the, if you know all the real value of an analytic function, then you have the imaginary part, which is the complex conjugate, which you get you know, immediately for free because you have all the increments along all the edges of the, I mean, you know, you know how, how the imaginary value increases by just looking how the real value increases and rotate it by you know, along the other edge and continue like that, okay? So, an analytic function in the discrete setting and also in the continuous one, if you know its real function in real value, you know its uh, complex, I mean, the, compl uh, the imaginary part also by just taking the, what we call harmonic conjugate. But basically in the discrete setting, it's clear, you know, if you have all the, if you know along all these edges, you know how, how the imaginary part uh, increases by just looking on, at how the real part increases on the other diagonal, uh, that will allow you to know uh, what happens to the entire imaginary part. And so the same is true in the, in the, in the, in the continuum, right? If you have an analytic function in the continuum, if you know its real value, you know its uh, complex value, I mean its imaginary value part too. Now there's a second thing which is nice about uh, analytic function, of, of course, then here, uh, that the real part is harmonic and the, the imaginary part is harmonic. So basically, if you know, you know the real part of an analytic function on some curve like this, then you know the real value of the analytic function all over here by just you know, solving a harmonic uh, question because the function is equal to Laplacian, you know, h is Laplacian uh, real value f is zero and you know the value here, so you know the value of f all over the place. And then you know the imaginary function also by taking the complex conjugate. So you know analytic function is something pretty stiff. And actually, 
there's, there are several things you can do. So this is still true in the discrete case, right? That uh, harmonicity, you know, simple random walk, and then you, you, you can solve uh, uniquely these things. So if you know a an discrete analytic function only on the boundary of a domain, then you know the real, I mean, the real value of the discrete analytic function on the boundary of a domain, then you know the analytic function itself, or, or in, I mean, the real value inside the domain by solving Laplace when u equals zero, and then you know it all, all over the domain up to additive constant by taking the harmonic conjugate. So now there's another thing uh, which is of course important is this notion, you know, that you have, if you have an analytic function, then uh, if I have a function a point uh, xi here and a contour c here, that f of xi is equal to one over two pi i times the uh, integral over the contour c of dz over uh, f of z over z minus xi or something. Maybe I have a sign wrong, okay? So that's just Cauchy integral formula that is more or less uh, basically, you know, that you can. And in particular, you have also the things about the derivatives, you know, that you can differentiate with respect to, to xi, this guy, and you get the derivative you know, as one over two pi i integral. Things like that, and uh, okay, and maybe I still have the signs wrong. <laughs> so, what you what you see here is that basically, if you know uh, a function f on some contour here, and you know it's analytic, then you know it all over the place. I mean, inside, and you know also you control all the derivatives also, and so. In particular, so you might always also say that if you know f. You don't know exactly sort of uh, f, but you, you have some information, roughly speaking, about, uh, you know, you could replace, say, this uh, contour integral by some, some integral involving, you know, you can average, you know, over several contours, like here, right? So that this integral is not an integral along a single path, but it's an integral, you know, area type integral, uh, something you could do also. And this would control everything. So the reason I'm saying this is that this will tell you, you know, that if you have limits of analytic functions, you know, the sequence of analytic functions, you know, and if, on, if in some weak sense, you know, or I have a sequence Fn of analytic functions, you know, and if in some weak sense, you know, you can control how Fn converges to F in that with respect to some area integral. So, you know, it converges to, in L1 to f in, in, in that domain, that will be enough because then the value inside anyway is given by an integral over the area, say, or along this uh, tube of uh, fn, and therefore, you know, by some soft convergence, will tell you that the fn inside uh, will converge nicely uh, to f inside and that everything will remain analytic because the contour integral will still uh, be valid. So, you know, there, there are very, I mean, it's a vast literature, you know, about limits of analytic functions and, uh, and, and things are nice because uh, you can always, uh, uh, you know, control uh, things by the derivative or by the integral as long as you have some tightness on the derivatives. And uh, you see here you have already that if this analytic function f converges nicely here, then the derivatives of the analytic function converge by just taking the contour integral. And so uh, this is the type of thing that tells you that we are not so in so, such a bad shape because what we have here is that in some sense we are looking, we would like to understand this um, uh, limit of f, right? So we would like to understand the limit of f squared. Now, uh, what we have here, okay, the things are not, f squared is not exactly analytical, but um, analytic, but uh, what we have understood here is uh, some harmonic function which in some sense is the primitive of f squared. So some analytic function which is the primitive of f squared will converge, or maybe of f, of f over square root of delta squared, because that's a natural, uh, object that we all uh, would like to define here. Uh, and um, so we have this convergence, 
and we would deduce from that the convergence of f squared itself. So somehow the derivative of uh, what happens in H. So you see, roughly speaking, the goal is to say, well, that the limit of H, which is a harmonic function, as we said before, that the limit of H is, in some sense, the limit uh, is the imaginary part of some analytic function. Right. And therefore, we want to say that the analytic function uh, is equal to the limit of the integral of this guy. And then by differentiating, you know, by taking limit of the differentiated pieces, because of the fact that once you, are, you have limits of analytic function, you can also control limits of derivative, to go to derivative and say, well, then, you know, the derivatives of these guys are the same, and therefore, f, f over square root of delta itself converges to uh, uh, the imaginary part of uh, uh, the analytic function that corresponds to uh, h itself. So let us uh, now be more uh, specific. So the first part is to have some tightness, you know, to prove what we want is get some, I mean, prove that, you know, f f squared over square root of delta has a subsequent limit. And then the next goal is say, well, assume that we have a limit, you know, for a certain delta n, and say something about it using this type of arguments. So note here that I've expressed, you know, h on a square minus h on a neighboring square. You know, here, this is just, you know, the real path integral, you know, of f over uh, square root of delta squared times b minus w, where b minus w was really the, you know, the discrete thing with mesh size already delta. So this is, the, this is really the actual discrete integral, if you want, of uh, f squared along the, from w to, I mean, path integral from uh, b to w, or from w to b. So you would rather put here this like this, right? So here you start seeing that the f over square root of delta is a natural thing that shows up in, the, in, in, in that uh, framework. I mean, another way to see uh, is, is just to say, well, I mean, you know, if I have a box of size 1 and you divide it into uh, 1 over delta pieces, right? You know, each time you move here, you move by uh, something which has to do with the f of e squared. You have 1 over uh, delta boxes. So if you go down like this, you'll have to, you know, meet. So each of the increases will be of order delta because h goes from 1 to 0. Therefore, maybe f is of order 1 over square root of delta because each increases. I mean, f is of order square root of delta because each of the increases is of order uh, uh, is f squared. Now, of course, you might say maybe it's not the case because maybe, you know, you have a plus and a minus and a plus and a minus, so maybe things cancel out, but actually they don't cancel out that well. That's one of the things on the list. Okay, so how do you prove that such a thing has subsequent limits? So the lemma is just say, So for any k compact in D, so in so you have the domain D here, and you have k, which is a compact subset of D, uh, what we want to say is that the sum over k of, I mean, for the uh, edges in k of um, f of e squared times uh, delta, that this is finite. So note that this, in some sense, is, you know, uh, you can view it like this. So it's really, you know, some area, your sum over all the 1 over delta squared, uh, little squared, I mean, you know, you have a, of order 1 over delta squared guy is in k. Right. So you sum this, 
And so you, sum, you have one over delta squared uh, pieces. So if you would just say that each of these guys corresponds to an area integral, you know, you would have to, to put a delta, to compensate this by saying that this is a delta squared times this, right? So that indeed, in some sense, uh, this quantity I wrote is really some, you know, discrete area integral of f of e squared. Yes? I'm sorry? No, I'm just saying that, I mean, you know, f will be of order square root, and so f squared will be of order delta. Oh, sorry. Okay, sorry. Thanks. So, in some sense, you know, this will tell us a lot because it will tell us, you know, that you have in some sense tightness uh, of uh, the function, you know, f of e squared over delta uh, with respect to some area type integral, but that, uh, because of what I said before, well, that will be enough, you know, because uh, you can have this, uh, this already says a lot. So, How do you prove such a statement? Well, the first remark is that, in some sense, this is a statement about H. Right? So one remark that you can make is that, you know, if I have a, if I look at the difference between the, uh, okay, so first remark, of course, is that if you add, you know, f of e squared here, plus s of e squared here, plus f of e squared here, plus f of e squared here, because of, uh, you know, uh, uh, Pythagoras theorem or whatever, this is just twice f of z squared, where z is the value at the corner here. So now, what happens if you look at h, uh, so if this is a black guy and this is another black guy here, and you look at what is the difference between h and b prime and h and b, right? So you take the value here squared minus the value here squared, or the other way around, minus the value here squared plus the value of here squared. So the value of here, say, is the imaginary part of f squared, and this is the uh, projection on e to the i pi over 4 squared. And here, uh, okay, and if you take the value here of the white guy here and the value of the white guy here, if you take this difference, you will get sort of a, say here, the real part squared plus uh, or minus the e to the, I mean, the projection on e to the i uh, pi over 4 squared. Now, it's a very simple exercise to check that uh, basically when you look at uh, f of z squared, um, how can I say? Yes, that this will be smaller than some constant, which I don't know which what number it is, but it's just a simple number, times h of b minus h of b prime plus h of w minus h of w prime. Because f of z anyway is going in one direction. You know, it's large in one direction. So if, you, if it's large in one direction, then anyway, there will be one of these two things such that the, you know, the, the difference will be very large also. So it could be maybe that, you know, this is large and it cancels out with this, but then, then in this contribution, you will get something very large because uh, cancellation, you know, you cannot be in all directions simultaneously f of z. So that's a, that's a simple argument, a simple combinatorial fact. So that when you look at this, you know, it suffices uh, to prove that to bound separately something like uh, sum uh, delta, say delta times the sum of the discrete gradients of H black and delta sum of discrete gradient of H white.
right? When I say that uh, discrete gradient of H black would be just the difference between a black vertex and its neighbor in that direction, and uh, the H white would be the difference between the white neighbor and its neighbor in that direction. Because then all the, you know, all the terms that are here are bounded by something that appears in the other, in the other thing. So in other words, you need, what you need to bound is some, you know, uh, uh, some sort of energy type uh, of H. And again, I mean, this can be interpreted in terms of uh, these things. So here it will be very important, again, to use the fact, you know, that H restricted to black and H restricted to white are exactly superharmonic and subharmonic. And you will see uh, when, when this comes into, into the game. So let me just um, remark one thing which is that um, suppose I have k here, I have d here, and suppose I take here some intermediate boundary, say, uh, I don't know, uh, call it like this, d or like this, right? some contour between the two. Now, we know that hb, you know, is a super harmonic, say. I guess that's the one. That's Laplacian. No, no, subharmonic. Laplacian is positive. Okay. So it is a natural thing to do. I mean, that's how Stas is doing things, is to say, well, let us define here uh, H tilde of V. This is going to be the function such that it is exactly harmonic inside delta, inside this guy. And it is equal to h on delta. Right? So h tilde b is just a function that is equal to h here. And instead of being super harmonic, it's exactly harmonic here. Why am I doing this? Because then if you just, it is natural to look at the difference so h minus h tilde b, the difference will still satisfy sort of Laplacian positive, because we know this is true for h, b, and this one, the Laplacian is 0. And this one has 0 value on the boundary. So this function has a nice interpretation because if you have a subharmonic, I mean a subharmonic function uh, like this, uh, then it is easy to to have an interpretation in terms of simple random walk of this guy. Right. So what I say is that imagine that suppose that you have a function let's say let's call it uh, uh, I. Say, right? Suppose I. Uh, satisfies so Laplacian of i is positive, and uh, inside this and this equal zero on this, right? So my claim is just if you if you follow the value of i along a random walk, right? Start from here. I follow the v value of i along a random walk. Eventually, here when I am out here, I stop and the value is zero because i is zero on the boundary. At, at each step, when you are here, you are going to, uh, because the Laplacian is positive, right? Laplacian positive is, means you are slightly larger, uh, you know, uh, if you take the mean of the neighbors than where you are. That means that basically you could just transform this into a plain martingale by at each step at each step, you decide to say, OK, let us subtract. You know the mean of what I, I'm going to gain at that point. So just by, by looking at you know, this simple martingale that is evolving, you know, that, is, that you get here. So the martingale here is, if you take a simple random walk, it's just you know, i of Sn minus something which is just the sum between j equal 0 and n minus 1 of Laplacian of h 
of SJ. Right? Because basically at each step, you know, you say, well, in average between uh, n and n plus one, I will lose Laplacian of, uh, of H, uh, Laplacian of I taking at the point at which I am. So I remove it and then I have an, you know, mean zero gain. Right? So this is a martingale, you apply stopping time theorem or whatever, and you end up immediately with the fact that I of Z, right, is nothing else then minus, okay, there's a minus sign, so let's put it minus here, uh, the sum over y of Laplacian h of y times the Green's function between x and y taken in the domain d here. Right? Because basically you have to mean out, you know, the average quantity that you get out of it. At the end, you know, at the end you will only get, you know, some over the expected value of zero sum between zero and the stopping time of Laplace and H uh, taken at SJ uh, times, uh, right, that's the quantity you get in the end here, right? And here this is going to zero at the end, okay? So I'm just saying something very trivial here. And therefore this, if you, if you just exchange, you know, the orders and do this sum between zero and infinity of a definite function that t is smaller than infinity and sum over y in the domain indicate a function that sj is equal to uh, y. Uh, you exchange the order, you get just this, where the Green's function is the mean number of times you spend at y uh, starting from x before exiting the domain. Okay. So here you see that the, the quantity, which is uh, this one here, has a simple interpretation in terms of a Laplacian, right? Because it's just a... So... Now there are two things that you want to say. The first thing is, okay, let's look at the sum. We are interested in, in this, right? So we're going to bound this by something like sum of Laplacian H tilde plus sum of Laplace, I mean, average value of H minus H tilde. Okay, no problem with that, because the sum of each of the terms there is just larger than what we have here. And this function right, is, the sum inside K of the gradient of H tilde, and H tilde is the harmonic function, you know, that takes some, uh, such that H, this converges to some nice function on delta, because we know that H is converging to something, right? That was our theorem that tells you that H, you know, was converging uh, nicely away from, when you are away from the boundary, it converges nicely to some smooth, a nice harmonic function, you know, uh, given by uh, something. So this converges nicely here when delta goes to zero. Okay. So when you look at the gradient of H tilde, it's just a harmonic function inside. So let us just look, you know, if you have a harmonic function here, you're looking at the difference between the harmonic function here and the harmonic function at the neighbor. So the harmonic function is just, you know, start a simple random walk here and take the mean value of the value of h at the exit point, or h tilde. Okay. And you know that because of our definition of k and d, d here, when you start somewhere here, you are anyway away from the boundary that you're looking at. Right, because you have some distance. If you are inside K, you are at some distance of the boundary. Yeah. So now there's a simple argument, you know, that tells you what sort of order of magnitude these things are, which is just that suppose here I have two points here, and I want to look at the difference between uh, the value of the harmonic function, you know, uh, here and the value of the harmonic function here. 
A simple argument is a ref reflection argument, which just says, suppose we cut this into two, and we couple these two simple random walks in such a way that they are symmetric to each other with respect to the, this axis that is between the two. Okay. So we, we take them symmetric until maybe they will hit, they will, you know, maybe the, this guy will hit here this separating boundary. This one will hit also the separating boundary, and then they continue together. So there's a simple way, you know, to look at the random walk starting from a point, to take a simple random walk starting from the other one, start them symmetrically until they, maybe they collide, and then they continue together. Right? So what you end up with immediately is the probability that they don't, I mean, if they couple, you know, if they couple, then they get, give the same contribution when they get out. You know that h, anyway, h tilde is bounded between 0 and 1. So the way to bound this guy, you know, is just say it's just the probability that a simple random walk started from here and a simple random walk started from here. If they're symmetric, they don't couple. So it just means it's just the probability that this guy, you know, reaches that distance before this line here. And this is just, you know, the neighbor here. Okay? And we know that. This distance, anyway, is given a macroscopic because you have uh, something macroscopic, and that this distance is just of order delta because it's just a neighbor. Okay. So the conclusion of this is that this quantity here, you know, it's uniformly smaller than some constant times delta. Because the probability that they don't couple is the probability that the one-dimensional guy, you know, makes it all the way to some macroscopic distance when being at distance delta. It's just an ordinary stopping thing. So here you have delta squared, uh, one of a delta squared uh, points there. So you know anyway that this is smaller than constant over delta. So this is what we want, right? This is type of bound we are looking after because we said that it's delta times this guy that we want to bound. Okay. So this one is no problem. So I'm doing on purpose, you know, instead of estimates about Green's function and so on, you know, these coupling things is, makes life uh, easier if you are probabilist. Now, now we want to bound this guy. So what I just said is that this quantity uh, okay, you have the average values here. So this is equal uh, if we look at what happens here, so h minus h tilde is basically this function here. So we're doing, we, we want to bound something. So this is the sum over x. So one way, let's take it like this. The sum over x of uh, Laplacian h minus h tilde. So let's not write a Laplacian, but just Laplacian is misleading. It's just the difference h uh, at uh, h minus h tilde at x plus e minus h plus h tilde at x. Right. So, and you write, let us write what it is in terms of, of this uh, decomposition here with the Green's function, because this is a subharmonic function. So now we're taking the difference between the value of the sub subharmonic function here and there. Right? So if we look at what you get here, it's just the sum over x of the absolute value uh, of the sum over y. So now we have Laplacian of h, taking it y, because of course Laplacian of h tilde is 0, so this is what we get here, times g of x plus e y minus g of x y. And here it is. Okay. Uh, maybe I forgot some uh, absolute value some way. Uh, no, I guess that's okay. So 
Now, you see that we are again, you know, this anyway is, has always the same sign. So you can say that this is just, you know, equal to uh, the sum over, I mean, smaller than the sum over x, the sum over y, of something which is sort of minus Laplacian, or no, the Laplacian is positive, Laplacian h of y times the sum over x of something like uh, g of x plus e minus g of y, g of x, y. So here we use the fact, which is important, that because we know that this is always the same sign, you know, we just can, we don't need to have an absolute value here. Okay? So, oh, so sorry, I, I did the sum. Yes? Well, it's the Laplacian of the difference, but this one is, is anyway harmonic. So the only thing that the thing you lose is because of h. OK, so you get a bound like this. So this is, you know, nothing mysterious, just, you know, decomposing this, uh, this thing and using the fact that you have an expression of your subharmonic function given some integral of the, of the Laplacian. So of course you might say, you know, if you're harmonic analysis, if you're stats, you say, well, of course, I mean, this, you know, this is sort of trivial thing that uh, the Green's function, you know, is uh, some inverse, uh, has to do with the kernel associated to Laplacian. And so this is just, anyway. But if you prefer simple random walks, it's also uh, as easy. So now it boils down to, com to have an upper bound of this type. And here again, you have, you know, simple random walk interpretation, you know? You, are co you have to compare, if you have x, you start from x here, and you, you have y here. Uh, you have to compare, you know, the mean number of times you, starting from here, you're going to visit y, and the mean number of times starting from here that you're going to visit y over there. Actually, there are several tricks you can play. You can also say, well, let's, we can, in, in, you know, interchange the order, I mean, g of x, y, and g of y, x, and then do something about the mean time you spend in k starting from y, and the mean time you spend uh, near a neighbor. But anyway, what, you, what is fairly easy uh, to see is that this will be smaller. So one way to say would be smaller than uh, delta times some constant. So it's the same delta coming out of this coupling argument times g of x, y, uh, sum for x. But anyway, you need very crude bounds here. So the very crude, I mean, the, the only thing you need, just for you to, to that there's no mystery here, uh, you know, you're looking at what is, I'm starting, I'm looking at the difference between this and that. Right? And these two, I mean, the, the Green's function is just, can be decomposed as starting from here, the probability to hit y at all, and then, once I hit y, I have a certain number, which is of order log uh, 1 over delta, which tells me how many started from y, how many times I'm going to visit y before going out. And you have upper and lower bound for this, which are very simple, because on the one hand, y you know, is uh, in delta. I mean, y, uh, sorry. Yeah, OK, so anyway, you have upper bounds, because uh, uh, you starting from y, you, will f you, know, you have diameter bounds on, on, on d or whatever. And so you just have to compare what is the, dif the difference between the hitting probability from here to there and the hitting probability from here to there. So the probability that one hits and not the other one, and this has to, you have exactly the same reflection type argument that tells you that you just have a delta that comes out in front, and, and the rest is just the same. Okay. So, and now you're happy because now you can bound this. You know, we can do this thing the other way around you recognize that this is, again, nothing else than uh, something that looks like a constant times uh, the sum of, uh, uh, in, of h. Okay. Or maybe the 
as an absolute value. Right? Could again, you exchange the x here, and for each x, you are counting exactly the quantity that is over there. So maybe it's uh, h uh, minus h tilde. It's the quantity itself. Okay. And there's a delta in front. Okay. And so now we are happy because how many guys, I mean, each of these guys is naturally bounded in a simple way because, uh, you know, h tilde, h is harmonic on the boundary, takes a value between 0 and 1 on the boundary, so it's between 0 and 1. And h itself, uh, we know it converges to something that uh, is also between 0 and 1. So these guys inside k, uh, all these guys, so this will be smaller than, say, 2 times uh, the number of guys in k. And so here we get something like a smaller than constant over delta because I have delta and 1 over delta. So it's a simple argument, but this is basically all you need because so what we end up with is that the integral in this sum, which is sum of f of e squared in k, now is bounded uh, independently of k, uh, of uh, delta. Um, so, which means that in some sense, f over square root of delta is tight. So of course here you can you know you can again depends on your taste maybe I'm not going to to do it uh, too much but it depends on 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 you know how familiar are with analytic functions or not but basically if you think that you know this guy is tied here you know you can you might you know play you know say that you have subsequential limits for these path integrals inside here and then use this discrete version of Cauchy formula you know to say that then all these functions here you know, if, if what you see here converges, you know, in, in that area type sense, then all the guys that are inside, the values that are inside, because they are, they will converge also to the corresponding area integral uh, having to do with the limit, and then they will be analytic and will have all the properties. So this tells you roughly, so from that you get simply using analyticity, that um, uh, uh, for any, you know, that the sequence, the family has subsequential limits that are uh, analytic. In other words, that if you have a sequence delta n that goes to zero, right? You can find sort of a nk going to infinity such that uh, f of delta nk over square root of delta nk uh, converges uh, uniformly inside k towards an analytic function. Okay. So here I slightly skipped something because I, okay. Uh, maybe it's, didn't find sort of a simpler uh, way to do this just as to give the slightly hand waving picture about, you know, contour integrals with respect to uh, sort of which are roughly speaking area things and the fact that once you have this tightness here, then <coughs> you will get this convergence of these contour uh, guys.
okay, analytic function uh, in, yeah, uh, inside, yeah, let's just call G. And in fact, because of the same, you know, of the same, uh, Uh, because of the same, uh, you know, now we are working with f again. f is really discrete analytics, so you can now, you know, don't have this problem with this f squared. Okay, so now the derivative of, um, no, sorry, the integral of f or the integral of f squared will also converge to, I mean, the path, once you have the integral of f over square root of delta, you will have you have this uniform convergence. You will have you will be able to do taking limit of path integrals of f squared, discrete path integrals of f squared. They will converge, also, and they will converge to the path integrals of the analytic function g. Okay, so g, uh, you know, has a primitive. Uh, let's call it uh, g bar, such that. So by that I mean that g is the derivative of another analytic function that you, you know, can obtain by these path integrals, uh, along path. g bar sh such that uh, what you get is that the integral of, you know, the path integrals of uh, uh, this converge to g bar. Right, so this is just, you know, you have uniform convergence, you know, along, along the path, and then you just take uh, you take this picture, right? What, what I mean by that is that you, you fix any point here, right? And you say, okay, let us take, you know, the discrete approximation on the lattice of this integral along this path from zero to some point z. Because this guy is an, uh, what, right? So what I know is that this quantity here converges uniformly to uh, g squared. Right? So the path integral here will just converge to the path integral of, uh, no, sorry, it converges to g. And so the path integral along, along this sim will converge to the path integral of g, and therefore it's the primitive. So you don't have anything to uh, worry about here. So here we have an analytic function. Right? And on the other hand, we know that this is exactly h. It's not exactly h, but uh, the imaginary part of this guy is just the, is h up to a constant. That's how H was defined, as what I recalled you before, that H was just uh, the imaginary part of the discrete path integral of G. <coughs> so here we have this analytic function G bar. Its imaginary part is H. We know its imaginary part, so we know uh, its real part. So, <coughs> so it's entirely, uh, it's entirely, uh, so this guy is converging to H. So we know that G, I mean, that the imaginary part of G bar is uh, G. Uh, is, uh, so H. So remember what H was. H was we had this function here. You have A here, B here. And one way to define h was to say that it was the harmonic function taking the value here, 0, here, and 1, here. And harmonic inside. That was h. Now, the natural way to think of, in terms of this is to define the conformal map phi here that maps this strip onto here, where this is height 1, this is height 0. The image of b here is here, and the image of a is here. Why is it natural to, do, to look at this? Because what you see is that phi is an analytic function because it's a conformal map. And what is h? h is just the imaginary part of phi. Yes? So we have an analytic function phi. Its imaginary part is h. Here we have another analytic function, which is g bar, 
its imaginary part is h. So they are the same because they're both analytic. So what you get is that j bar is phi plus some constant. Because if I know the imaginary part of an analytic function, I know the analytic, entire analytic function up to a constant. OK, so now we're done, because now we know that We know that g, right, is the derivative of g bar. Right? So we know that f delta n k over the square root of delta n k converges to uh, g, and g is g bar prime. And because if you differentiate, you know, a function plus a constant, you lose the constant. So conclusion is that elf, if there's a, if you take a subsequential limit, then this guy uh, now I'm slightly Maybe I should say so, uh, so G squared, right? You are with me here? I should have said G squared instead of a G here. So, so G is the square root of this guy. So it's the square root of this guy. And indeed, so this converges to phi prime to the 1 half. And we're done. Okay. So you see that technically, I mean, um, there's nothing. You know, uh, you have the impression you know, that everything is smooth. You know, no problem. You know, everything you know falls into the pieces nicely. Okay, I, maybe I've been slightly sloppy uh, in this tightness uh, picture here, but I prefer you know to leave it like this uh, rather than uh, confusing you. Uh, but you know, there, there was this, you know, here at some point we used the fact that this was superharmonic, subharmonic, and that you could, you know, the absolute value was equal to the value itself. And uh, <coughs> so there is nothing deep here, you know, in, in, in that part, you know, of the proof. It's just, you know, going downhill using all different tricks of analytic, discrete analyticity, and so on. But still, it builds a lot on the fact that you know there was this separation between, I mean, using very much the fact that you had one guy which was superharmonic, one guy was subharmonic, and that in some sense this, you know, makes that the entire you know fluctuation of h and of f of everything everything is sort of really squeezed and controlled by the usual tricks of analytic functions. Uh, so in a way, you know, this part was just you know were going downhill from you know once you had that h. Converged. Now, uh, it looks nice, but of course, you know, it, it took you know some stas, you know, to <laughs> clean out you know uh, the arguments and to find that you know each time the cleanest and simplest uh, way to so that it looks easy. You know, uh, often you know you have the the first proof is messy and so on, and then later on you know 15 years later you know you have people write textbooks or whatever, they clean this, and then they progressively, you know, it gets to a version that, is that you can get in a textbook. And as a student, you can read here. Now, you know, he's, he's doing all the job pre-processing everything. So each, I mean, it's also true already in his uh, percolation paper that, you know, the paper comes out, and it looks like, you know, uh, everything is clean and, and, and uh, nice, and it looks so simple that you think, well, you know, how possibly can we have missed these things? But, you know, it, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, subtle uh, things going on in cleaning processing before uh, uh, before getting uh, to a version like this. And also, it's I think it's okay if you speak to students. You know, it's a good lesson because uh, 
sometimes when we want to prove something, you know, when you don't care about the proof, uh, you just want the proof to be correct, you don't care about elegance or something, but you, you know, but in, in a case like this, you know, where once the proof is out, you know perfectly that you know, many people will read it and comment and try to lecture on it and so on. Uh, so if you want to be really read, uh, then you should, one should also do the effort, you know, trying to find the most elegant and nice proofs because the stuff which is not nice in the end uh, will not be read. <laughs> you know, even if the result is nice, if the proofs are ugly, then you, you don't find many readers, right? So it's okay. I mean, most of us, you know, write papers and not read by many people, but uh, the results are okay. So, but, um, so it's rare, this type of configuration is rare. You know, the thing comes out and it's already very clean. So maybe I should make a few comments. A few comments is about this entire proof of, of easing is uh, that first of all, you know the relation f of n plus f of south was equal to f of west plus f of east was true uh, basically for any fk model at south dual point. Right? The fact that then you can interpret it directly as a analyticity property, uh, only you know the fact that you have the basically Pythagoras theorem or whatever, you know, that's related to the fact that you are really looking at easing model and that this thing you are um, playing with uh, is, is the square root and so on. Uh, but still, I mean, there is a lot of potential uh, for, uh, you know, improvements of, not improvements, but generalization of the results in, into many directions. So. The first direction is, of course, uh, the other FK models, right? You know, try, you know, use this F north process of south thing in a different way. Maybe you should use different uh, uh, ad hoc uh, lattices, or I don't know, for each Q. But uh, clearly, you know, one should be able to make something out of the relation that still holds for the other models. So. That's, that's one remark. The other remark is that, in some sense, it's not uh, restricted. You know, you never use really uh, deep, deeply the fact that you have the square lattice. You may have, you know, a distorted square lattice of so, so some other type of lattice, you know, isoradial, or I don't know how they're called. And you know, and you put the slightly different weights according to what, what you see. You know, if locally, you know, in Kenyon's papers, you have always this idea that if you have different uh, special type of lattices, basically, you know, they have a natural angles that you can define on them. Uh, so maybe by weighting differently the things on the different uh, lattice directions for more general lattices, you can, uh, you can get, uh, you can make it, you know, to, to generalize this to other lattices than z squared. Because then, the, you know, self-dual points and these things have been sort of generalized in, in, in for, for those guys. Also, uh, but of course, one has to be careful, you know, because all these technical paths, you know, the downhill and the Laplace, I mean, subharmonic, subharmonic, you know, <laughs> you have to be, uh, make, find a way, you know, to make all these things work. But, uh, yes, so, so the other lattices is, is, is another thing. So, uh, and really, the situation is very different from, uh, from, uh, from the percolation proof, right? The percolation proof was looked, stuck, clearly to, to the percolation picture. And this one, actually, if you think about it, you know, Q equal 1, which is percolation, is also in the picture here. You know, this F of north process of south, you know, the angles, you know, they are not trivial. It's pi over 3. So you have a relate, this, this discrete thing is a, gives also some relation for percolations on the square lattice. You know, so maybe this would be the right way to prove per, that critical percolation on the square lattice uh, is also conforming variant. Maybe this will be the way, you know, to reach self-avoiding walks, to reach... Uh, so there, there is really a lot of potential uh, behind this proof. Uh, and, uh, and Stas is fairly confident, uh, you know, about the fact that he will be able to, you know, uh, settle many things there. And uh, you can trust him uh, if he's uh, claiming something, then it's pretty clear that he will uh, uh, deliver also. And in fact, if you look at this paper, right, it's, the title is, you know, he, he left things quite open, you know, conformal invariance in random cluster models, one, right, and then easing. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it might be a long sequence. So it's, it's, not, uh, it's not finished. So it could be, for instance, that for Q equals three, you can cook up something because then the angles are nice. It could be that, uh, okay, so 
there, there is a, a lot of room on the, uh, to try to do something there. And I, I'm pretty sure, you know, Stas is not uh, sitting on it. You know, he likes to do things uh, himself. And once he releases it, you know, people can play also with it and contact him if they have ideas or so. Uh, Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's it's clear. I mean, the the, you know, then again, then you have the the same story than we had for the population. First of all, you have conform. I mean, you prove convergence of some observable. This observable here, this type of observable that is defined in terms of f is nice because when you, okay, this is something I haven't explained, but in the other cases, you know, when you move around gamma, right, then. Um, the observables, because uh, because there's this you know this f is analytic. So uh, you know if you apply a conformal map, it be, can be rotated. You know the angles. You know f by what what was horizontal becomes uh, vertical or something, right? So here, roughly speaking, the f gets rotated, and but the definition of f makes that this square root. I mean the the this is the 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 exponent that is in front. So we have phi prime to some power that comes out in the front. Okay, I don't want to give too many details, but Roughly speaking, the general sort of feature that you recognize Martingales, you know, in that just knowing what what you, you recognize this function, you know, as these powers phi prime to be Martingales, and then you recognize which kappa corresponds to which q. So this is no problem. And uh, of course, the only I mean, then the the only so the proof I gave you for the convergence to SLE works out exactly the same way. You know. Because here again, you have Carter-Odori convergence on boundaries and so on for, for the scaling limit. So everything works out the same way. The only point you have to be careful is with tightness, you know, to make sure that in these, these expression guys have subsequential limits. Right? That's what you have to slightly to worry about. But otherwise, the rest of the proof is exactly the same as in the percolation proof I gave you, right? which was also one reason to insist on that. Because that's, you know, this, uh, once you have this, uh, this uh, convergence of, of, of these uh, functionals, then you are fine. So here it's clear that you know kappa equal uh, 16 over 3 or whatever will show up, uh, and, and that indeed you get. Then out of that you will be able to get all the I mean all the cutoff exponents and so on, uh, in the same way we had for. for Critical oriented. Well, it depends on how you orient it. Yes. Well, I mean, uh, I mean, I guess yes. I mean, uh, if if you if you try, no. I mean, depends. I mean, if you are, if you orient it, you know, if locally they are oriented, but globally is an, an, an asetropic, then you're okay. If of course you are oriented, you know, only north and east and. But if you if you are locally, you know, or then okay, yes, yeah, that will be okay. So in a way, I mean, so for instance, if you if you discuss with uh, Oded, for instance, so his view is is that uh, his goal he would be happy, you know, to have for each of the important values one natural discrete models that converges. So you know, many of us think you know finding uh, z squared percolations, h percolations z squared is, is a very important goal. So Odette says, well, I mean, uh, I want you know it's it's more tantalizing for me you know to get a q equal three or q equal four model which is really uh, converging to see something new. Uh, so I mean, it's clear that you will not you will never get you know a complete you know global you know universality type result that for any percolation model on any graph a PC and so on. It's clear that in all these pictures you know we are looking at special graphs where the actual self dual picture uh, val uh, value is known, right? So it will always be you know working with some specific graphs that have some certain relations, proving their convergence in conforming variance. But uh, for other model, I mean. Uh, you 
so this will only go, always go into the direction you know, cer certain nice models have can be controlled. So for the moment, there's no you know argument saying you know it's like universality type of thing that takes it. whatever whatever you know this say side percolation on z squared you know uh, critical one looks absolutely ho hopeless or out of reach of all these techniques because we don't know what PC is you know you don't have a formula so you don't expect to be able to prove anything. Okay. Yeah, I'll stop here and then tomorrow morning.